So I just thought a little bit of show business to start off with. So, um, oh yeah, right. So this is so this is me. I'd like to say thank you very much for coming. Thanks very much to the organisers of this really this really amazing conference. Um, I'm what I'm going to talk. This introduction is is uh, stuff about me, which doesn't really matter very much. It's, it's things that I put here just to kind of reassure myself that I'm that I'm not totally inadequate. But it does it doesn't work. This is my co-presenter, Dimitri. He's not here today because he's uh, uh, had a skiing accident and knackered his knee. And um, I, w I would he's jointly responsible for this talk, so I want to tell you a little bit about him. Mainly I want to tell you, he's, he's, he's a great guy, he really knows this stuff very well. And uh, he is a, he is a co disorganizer in chief, he calls himself, of the unconferences, Jay Crete and Jay Alba. Have you heard of Jay Crete? No. Have you heard of Jay Alba? No, you haven't heard of Jay Alba, but you should have done. Jay Alba is the uh, unconference in Scotland, the Java unconference in Scotland. We finished last week. I, I'm the local organizer of it, so I just want to give it a moment's uh, prom promotion. We finished in, uh, in Edinburgh last week. We had three, three days of really uh, good times, interesting talks and interesting outings. Um, J, J. Alba 2020, we haven't quite fixed the date for it, but it will be in May next year. So follow J. Alba Unconf on, uh, on Twitter or go to the, or go to the website jalba.scot. That's uh, because that's, it's a can't miss event for, for 2020. So onwards to what lies beneath. So the, the idea of what lies beneath is that it's yet another hello world talk. Oh great, another hello world talk. Well what we're going to try and do in this talk is to uh, take a tiny class and, and see what happens. The idea of it is that we're going to see what happens all the way down when we type just when we, when, we, when we run this tiny program, you'll see that it's really, really trivial. And, and what happens is amazingly complicated, even for the simplest of programs. So it's going to take me, I will be working really hard to fit even a, a glimpse of what's going to happen into, into 45 minutes. But it's also really interesting and very instructive. So I think it's worth, it's worth knowing this stuff. And the big lesson to take away from it is that what Dimitri and I found out in exploring this, because like we aren't, he's, quite, he's pretty knowledgeable, but I'm really not that knowledgeable about some of the stuff I'm talking about today. But you can find, I found it out, and you can find it out with simple tools that are available for free. Uh, and and, uh, and I'm, um, the message I want you to take away from this is, this stuff is not only interesting, but it's also quite important. That it's something that every programmer should know something about. Well, every Java programmer does know something about it. Everybody knows that we start off with Java source, and we compile it to bytecode, and then the bytecode is, is executed as machine code. So, so that much we do know. Um, but what exactly happens there? Well, let's have a look at let's look at that little program, the computer.java that I told you about. Here's the class. It's the the idea of it is we've got a we've got a, a, a tiny method private uh, add which takes a value and adds 254 to it. It's going to be called by a, a, a method compute, which takes a, which also takes a value, and it divides it by uh, by a, a big negative. Uh, number hex dead beef, and, the, and and that in turn is called from our from the main method of our computer class, which um, which supplies the value cafe babe to it zero x cafe babe. Does anybody know where that where that comes from? That's quite a, a, a traditionally classic uh, constant in the in, in Java in the Java world cafe babe. It's the it's it's the uh, it's the standard header in the in the class files. But do you know where? Do you know why they why they chose that particular constant? Okay, the, the, this is a story that's now lost in the mist of time. But James Gosling, the original the original designer of Java, used to take his breaks in a in a cafe where he kind of where he fancied the cute baristas. So you would never get away with that now. <laughs> But uh, hey, that was, it was a long time ago. So, 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 the, so the idea of this, um, 
so the idea of this program is we're going to supply Cafe Babe the, the, this, this number to the, to the compute method. The compute method is going, to, is going to do the division. We'll look at this in a bit of detail. Between uh, it'll, it'll divide Cafe Babe by dead beef, supply that to the add method, and the result will be um, 255. Because ca uh, dividing Cafe Babe by dead beef gives the value 1. Two big negative numbers. Okay, so let's have a look at the, what happens when we take this Java program and we and we compile it. So the um, the the Java Java C produces the bytecode, and we can look at what's in the uh, the class file as a result of that using Java P. So that will decompile it. If we if we say minus verbose, then we'll then we'll get uh, quite a lot of interesting information. What's that information? Well. So we've got um, uh, 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 three areas that I want to draw attention to. There's really quite a lot of output, but, uh, but I've cut it down to just three, uh, three areas that are interesting. So the first, one is, um, the first one is the constant pool. So the constant pool has, um, contains, as the name implies, it contains literals. I mean, that's, they'll do, that, this will do for our purpose. It's got the, the, the literals Cafe Babe and Dead Beef. Uh, that are that that, are, that are, because they are known at compile time, they, it's it's okay to have them as constants in in the in the program, and it's also got uh, things like method references, um, as in the, in this case, it's got a, it's got the method reference to the, to, to, to the add method. For each method, uh, in in this case, we've uh, in this case, this is the output for compute. For each method, there are, there are two areas I want to t uh, draw your attention to. One of them is the, is the, is the actual code. So here's, so here's the code, and we'll look at this in, in a bit more detail. These are the byte codes. It's often referred to as the machine codes for the Java virtual machine. So we'll see, we'll see how, the, how those work in a moment. And there's the local variable table, which is effectively the, um, the, it's the stack for the, it's a stack frame for, the, for this method. So when you call the compute method, there's a, there's, um, a space allocated on the, uh, on, the, on the method stack for the Java virtual machine. And traditionally, the first element that's put into that, it, it, into, the, into a stack frame, is a reference to the, uh, for, if it's an instance method, it's a reference to the current object. So as you, as you can see, slot zero, the first slot has, uh, has this in it. And then the next slots are given over to parameters that are supplied to the to the uh, to the method. So it's, so in, so in this case, the second slot is given to value, which is the first and by the way the only parameter to the compute method. And then subsequent ones are given over to local variables declared declared in the method. Well, the uh, the compute method doesn't declare any local variables, so the local variable table for compute only has those two elements in it. So let's have a look at what happens <coughs> when we execute when we execute this code. The um, the Java virtual machine isn't a register machine. It doesn't have any registers. Instead, it has an operand stack separate from the uh, separate from the stack the stack frames of the local variable table that I just talked about. This operand stack is uh, basically it's the working the, the working memory of the Java of the Java virtual machine, and every operation um, essentially either puts things onto the uh, onto the the um, operand stack, takes things off the operand stack, or manipulates values that are already on the operand. Stack. The first one here, a load zero, which is highlighted. That one, uh, a load means I'm going to load a reference. Loading means I'm going to push it onto the operand stack. Zero means I want to take the first element from the um, from the uh, local variable table. And traditionally, a load zero is often is the first bytecode uh, instruction for an instance method, because you almost always want to have a reference to the current object on the operand stack. So, so a load zero refers to the first slot on the local variable table, and the, uh, and the result of the, the load pushes this down onto the, pushes the value in, the, in slot zero onto the operand stack, which is, of course, this. On to the next one, I load one is something is something clearly very similar. So that's uh, I load means I want to load an integer rather than loading a rather than loading a reference. But I load one means load 
uh, the integer value from, the, from slot one of the local variable table, which of course is value in this case. So that's going to, so that's going to push Cafe Babe onto the, onto the operand stack, and this will then become the, 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 lower, the next lower element. The next, the next instruction is a load C, which, as you might imagine, is going, to load from the, is going to load from the constant pool. So the idea of this is it's going to take slot 2 from the constant pool, and, it's going to, and load, of course, again means it's going to push that onto the, uh, onto the operand stack. Uh, it's a constant in this case, because if you look at the Java code for compute in the top right-hand corner of the slide, you can see that the, that the divisor for the, integer, for the division operation here is a constant. It's dead beef. So, so the, uh, so the, JV, so the uh, Java bytecode already knows what the value of that's going to be. So it can get it from the constant pool, and, and that then gets pushed onto the, uh, onto the operand stack. And, and, and we're now ready to do the division. So the division divides the... Uh, divides in, uh, into the, um, the... The division has for, for the divisor the top element on the operand stack, and the dividend, the thing that's being divided by, is the next one down. So, so the idiv instruction here divides Cafe Babe by dead beef, takes both of them off the stack, and returns the, and pushes back onto the stack the result, of the result of doing the division, which is one in this case. We're now ready to call the add method. If the add method is private, in the, in the original Java code. That means that, it can't, that you can't get virtual method dis dispatch with it. So it's, not an, so it's not invoke virtual, which most uh, method calls are in, in Java. This one's invoke special because, because there's no possibility of it being overridden and there's no need to, look, to go through a dispatch table for it. So invoke special on, th on slot three on the constant pool, which is the... Um, which is the, uh, the, the, the a reference a reference to the add method, and that pops the um, the, the 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 value of the top on the operand stack as the parameter to the to the to the method add, and then it needs a receiver. What's add is an instance method. What's the object that, that the add method is going to be called on? Well, the answer is that it's the next one down on the operand stack. It's this. So it calls. So the invoke special line that is highlighted there is going to call this dot add with the with the argument one. Right? So this and, uh, and one are taken from the operand stack, and the add method is the is slot three in the constant pool. And the result of that is. That call, take, that call removes both of those two elements from the operand stack and pushes onto the operand stack the result of doing the add, which, as we saw before, is 255, because it adds 254 to it, and now we're, re and now we're ready to return. So we, and when we return, the top, element on the, the top element on the operand stack is the return value from the, from the, from the call. So that is how uh, the, that's the execution of these few simple bytecodes. You can see there's quite a lot going on there, but it, uh, and it's really quite a simple, um, it's, it's quite a quite a simple method. But uh, it gives you, it maybe gives you an maybe gives you an idea of what's happening. So that's Java to bytecode, and that's how the that's how the bytecode executes. But uh, we, want to we want to look at a bit more than that. We want to see how does that... We're going to go down the next stage and see wh what does that look like when you turn it into machine code. Well, obviously, that's going to depend on, on your machine. But if we're looking at x86 code, here is the template code for the, for the operation IDIV, just one of those bytecodes. So if you, if you use the print interpreter uh, uh, flag, when you, when, you, when you call Java, you'll get the output of all of the, the machine code that's being used to execute your, your Java program. And it's really nicely divided up. Each byte code has a big slice of machine code, of x86 machine code, corresponding to it. And this is the, ex this is the x86 machine code that corresponds to that, to that IDEV operation. So Dimitri and I looked at this and we thought, all oh, right, okay, if you're not really very familiar with x86 machine code, and it is quite hard to understand for historical reasons, then there's quite a lot to, uh, to take apart here. But it turns out to be simpler than you'd think. So the first thing is that the, um, uh, the, there's a big chunk of code at the beginning of this IDEV section, and the idea of that is it's just going to take stuff off the, uh, off the call stack of the x86 machine 
and it's going to transfer it to the reg to registers. So the, the dividend will go into the EAX register of, uh, of, of the machine, and the divisor will go into the ECX register. And they're, ta they're taken off, off, the, off the call stack for, the, um, for, the, for, the, for your Intel architecture. So that's kind of quite simple, and you, we, you soon get the hang of seeing what that looks like. And at the bottom, there's a whole lot of code which is exactly the same for all of the, for all of the operations, that the, the template, all of the template code that the template interpreter produces. And it's just to do with jumping back to the, uh, to the interpretation loop of the, of the template, of the, of the, um, uh, of, the, of the template interpreter. And it's really only this stuff in the middle that does the division. You can see that, at near, that right at the bottom of this patch in the middle, there is, there is in fact an IDIV operation. And this is I, uh, x86 IDIV machine code. So we, kind of, we had to scratch our heads and think, what on earth is all the rest of this about? All we're doing, you would think, wouldn't you, that the byte code that for dividing one number by one integer by another would translate into uh, uh, the, into a, an x86 machine code instruction for dividing one integer by another. That's that was our that was our first thought. And we looked at the, we had to look at this for a little while. Can anybody guess? Do you think what do you, what might be going on here? I'll make it a little bit easier for you by showing you there are two jumps in here. So there's a comparison. There's a jump not equal. There's, uh, there's, uh, as, uh, the XOR line is about just zeroing out the EDX register. It's just a, it's just a, a, a neat way of, of zeroing it out. Then there's a comparison, a jump if equal. Then there's a CLTD, which you don't need to worry about. And finally, the, finally the, actual, the division that actually does the work. Can you think why there would be all this uh, throat clearing and all this preliminary stuff going on before you, do the, before you actually do the division? Sorry? Sorry, I can't hear you. I have to shout. You, you might think it was because of division by zero, but actually division by zero raises a, hard, raises a hardware interrupt. So we don't need, that's something we don't need to worry about. Pardon? Sorry again? It's not a kind of optimization, no. In fact, it's, a, it's, it's very non-optimal. It's clearly a big overhead to every division. OK, so, so let me ask you, let, I mean, it took us a while to figure it out, so don't feel um, embarrassed about this. What, can, you, can you think, if you think about the application of math.abs, the absolute value of um, uh, which, you know, the standard, the standard method in, in, in the math class, for getting, for getting an absolute value. Can you think of any case in which it doesn't work exactly as you might expect? Sorry? Overflow. That's the one. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's it. So, so uh, uh, integer dot min value is minus 2 to the power 31. But integer dot max value is 2 to the power 31 minus 1. That's the way that uh, two's complement arithmetic works. So, if, so if, if there's a problem about trying to generate, you, they always have to look out for trying to generate the number 2 to the power 31, because it, you can't represent that in two's complement arithmetic in a 32-bit word length. So what is the combination of operands that might produce that? via integer division that might produce that result of 2 to the power 31. You've got to divide something by something to produce two, both of them legal values, to produce this illegal value, 2 to the power 31. Absolutely. If you try and divide integer dot min value by minus 1, you're going to get a value that can't be represented, and that's what they're, that's what they're looking out for. So if we change the, um, uh, so if we draw a flowchart, I never thought I would do one of these again. And <laughs> I went looking for my flowchart template, but it was like <laughs> gone, long gone, decades ago. Uh, then you can see that what's happening here is that actually what the the code that you see here is is executing that flowchart. It's looking to see if the dividend is the minimum value, and if it is, 
And if it isn't, then it's, then it's going on to do the div. And if, it, and if it is, then it's checking to make sure that the divisor is, is not minus one. And that, because that's the combination of values you can't, that it can't cope with. So I just thought that was really, I thought that was quite interesting to show the kind of overhead that, that if you always generate exactly the same machine code for every byte code, you're going to have to, you're going to encounter that overhead every time. And we're going to see that's actually pretty inefficient and they've put in a lot of effort to make sure that that actually doesn't, isn't the case for uh, performance critical programs, that, that you, uh, the, your performance critical Java programs. So let's go on and take a look at how they, at how they improved on that. First of all, let's see how we could improve on it. If we look at our original program, you you can see that there's uh, clearly it's not it's not great in performance terms. Uh, apart from anything else, there's a method call in here from compute to add, which you which you could see you could clearly eliminate that just with constant folding. So or inlining rather inlining. So if we inline the the the, um, the add method, which is just adding 254, we get a, we get a, a a program that looks like this. And compute now should be a little bit more efficient, and we can test to see whether or not that's the case. This is just one optimization that we can do. If we do it by hand, this 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 is what this is what it'll look like. We'll benchmark it using JMH. JMH is the Java Micro Benchmarking Harness, which is now built into the JDK. You should always use this if you've got any serious performance measurements to do on small, on small bits of code. Uh, the, it, it, although it's, it doesn't make your, your performance measurements bu bulletproof by any means at all, it will prevent you from making some of the most elementary mistakes which almost every naive benchmark falls into. So I'm not going to explain all the stuff that all the stuff that's in there. There's a um, there's a reference at the end of the talk to the GitHub re repository for which which has all the code that we use in this talk, and a JMH itself is pretty well documented, and so there's, there's so there's plenty there for you to get started on. Anyway, the blue the blue code here is the is what we're actually uh, is, is what we're actually benchmarking, and we're going to do it twice. Once with the um, once with the unoptimized code, and once with the code that we've improved by, um, by inlining it. And, and, hi and here's, here's the results. And you can see that although it's not a huge improvement, the in inlining, our manual inlining, r really did get us a, a bit of a gain. The, the score there is the number of nanoseconds per operation. So smaller numbers are better. And you can see that the that, that improved means that the that the manually inlined code gave us a significant a significant performance improvement. The dash x int there means we want to run this code interpreted. We want to prevent the we want to prevent the just in time compiler from doing anything other than using that template code that I showed you a moment ago. That that and all the other template instructions for the for the byte codes, <coughs> because. What everybody also knows, besides the fact that um, that your bytecode is interpreted um, into by as the template code, unoptimized, after a w the while it is running, the, uh, the, the there's a profiler inside of every modern JVM. We're looking at Hotspot in this case, but every every modern JVM does something similar. Profiles the code, looks for those areas which are really um, performance critical, like um, like tight inner loops. Typically, it's if the code is if if a, if a byte code is executed more than several thousand times, something around about ten thousand times, then in that case, that 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 byte code instead of being um, simply interpreted by the template interpreter, is compiled into machine code, and then a whole bunch of optimizations, like for example that um, that. Uh, in inlining that I showed you there are, apply are applied to it, and that makes it th and that can make a huge that can make a huge difference to um, to the performance of your code. Absolutely enormous. We'll 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 see, we'll see this in a moment. So without inlining the the machine code for what we um, for for what we what we um, for our little computer looks looks like this. So the compute method um, is called by the Sorry, calls calls the um, is called by the so computer benchmark method, which is the outer one, calls the compute method of the computer, which you saw, which in turn calls the calls the add method. 
And so there's a, so there's, uh, a lot of work to do there, and you saw all the machine code instructions. If we, al if we allow the, um, the hotspot compiler to optimize this to, to the greatest degree that it can, then what's going to happen is that it will, with inlining and with constant folding and with some other optimizations, it's going, to, it's going to turn it into a single machine code instruction. So, that, so if we run the benchmark again, but this time we don't say um, uh, dash x int, which prevents the um, which prevents the the hotspot compiler from doing its optimization. But instead, we uh, we, we allow the, the 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 optimizations to take place. You can see that there's an enormous gain. It goes from um, it, it, this instead of being instead of improving by a factor of like 20% or something bef as, as before, it improves by a factor of like 90%. And so running, running your code interpreted is a really bad idea, but it's very useful for these experiments to be able to see just how effective the hotspot compiler is. And the hotspot compiler is, is, is this effective because it's applying standard compiler optimizations that have been uh, developed by compiler engineers for over the last many decades. I mean, none, no, most, none of this stuff is new, or I don't think... Uh, most, of, most of this is not new. Some of, it is, some of it is new, but most of these are standard compiler optimizations. But, but they are very, very effective. And the really aggressive ones, which are quite expensive to do, so they're not done except on the... That's why they're not done except on the code that really deserves them, because it's in, a, in some tight inner loop somewhere and will be performance critical. And those optimizations really make, make, it, make a huge difference. <coughs> So that's how we get to that's that's how we get to the, to the to the machine code in effect. So let's think about that, that's, that. That's our story about about getting down to the optimized code. But now what we have to go on to is think about well what actually happens if we're going to go all the way down. We've got we've got uh, the, our very high quality machine code super optimized, and now what happens is your program executes, and 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 we have to try to understand what's going on here. And this is the best graphic I could find to describe what happens when a program executes. It's really 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 complicated, and there is a huge amount going on. So uh, why is this? Why uh, when I was a lad. As we say, in, as, as, as we say uh, satirically at home, computers are really simple things. I mean, I, this, this is what I learned a computer looked like. It had an input device and had a CPU and had an output device. Uh, how much more complicated did it need to be? Well, yeah, there was memory, right? So it had to get, so it had to get instructions and data from memory into the uh, into the CPU, and then it executed those instructions on the on on the data and sent some data back to memory. And what what else was there to do? Then, well, were these other things that were, that were called uh, that you know like tape, disk, and tape. Nobody nobody would remember tape. Slow devices. Those you had to deal with those differently because because you, you knew that it was going to take a really really long time to get the data for, to, get, to get data data and instructions from those, and therefore you had to have a whole lot of um, mechanisms to do with uh, suspending threads because because of the length of time it took to retrieve the data. But it turns out. The, with the passage of time, what's happened is that these slow devices, well, these slow devices are, are typically so slow that we don't use them at all anymore, but memory is now the slow device. Processors have become so fast over the decades, they've just increased in, increased, increased in speed and this, with this amazing um, regularity, an exponential increase over, dec uh, over decades, which has resulted in them being far, far faster than any other component of the system, and in particular, far faster than memory. So if every instruction, if, if, if this old-style, simple architecture was still in force, then the vast majority of processor time would be spent waiting for uh, data and instructions to be retrieved from, from memory. The, 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 typically, the length of time it takes for, for uh, data or... Uh, or uh, for either of those to, c to come over the main memory bus, even the fastest main memory bus, is something between 100 and 1,000. Typically, it's, it's nearer 1,000 than 100 times uh, slower than, uh, than, than a processor cycle. So, so, if you were just, so if the processor was just calling up, uh, it's, the, it's required, the required contents of memory, one location at a time, it'd be spending most of its time drumming its fingers, waiting for something to happen. And the processor would be really cold, and all the money you've spent on it, and all those improvements would be worth nothing. So, 
so that if you look at a modern chip, this is what it looks like now. This is, um, this is Ivy Bridge. It's not so modern anymore. But this is, this is an Ivy Bridge processor. And you can see that a huge amount of this is given over. There's a big cache, a big level three cache there. And, and what isn't shown, what isn't highlighted on this graphic, is the amount of the, uh, the, the space that's allocated to the cores, which is also used for level two and level one cache. So, so in some cases, some modern chips have up to about 80% of the real estate is assigned to cache. And that relates to the problem of the slow access of, of, of memory, um, of data and instructions from memory, because it's required the way that they, the way that the hardware engineers get around the, this problem is by having a hierarchy of different levels of memory. These have always been present in computers, but they now, but they didn't used to be on the chip. They've now migrated to the chip. So, uh, so a processor core, which is very, which is typically very, you know, it's very fast, which, as we know, we're talking about nanosecond cycle time. It's about four times faster than the L1 instruction cache, or the L1 caches, rather, which are, uh, which are, local, to, which are local to each core, which, which in turn are roughly about four times faster than the level two cache, not always present, and again, about four times faster than the L3 shared cache, the last, le the last level cache. And the idea, the idea is that the hardware engineers use very clever um, heuristics to try to make sure that the data that the, that the processors are going to need is present in the level one cache at the time, at the time they need it. And so it's all, to do, it's all to do with clever prediction of how they should feed the data uh, and instructions up this, uh, up this cache hierarchy. Uh, in order to in order to get to the in order to make it available to the um, to the to the um, uh, to the processor when the processor needs it. Now the reason why they, why why they do it in this way rather than just having a huge level one cache is that is that as you go up here they get faster and faster these caches get faster and faster but they also get more and more expensive and they get more and more power hungry. So you couldn't have uh, a, a, level, a huge level, um, cache of the size that, that, that we saw on the last graphic. You couldn't have that all as level one cache. It would be, it would, the chip would melt, and it would be far too expensive as well. So, 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 the, so the idea is that you can think of this as a kind of as a sort of pipeline, which has to be which has to be fed, and as long as the as long as the uh, data and instructions can be fed up this pipeline, so the processor always has what it needs close to its hand, then everything goes really smoothly. But if there's a cache miss, which happens sometimes, maybe uh, some, maybe the prediction algorithm that the hardware is using to try and work out where your program's going to go next and what data it's going to need. Maybe that works out wrongly. So you've been, on a you've been uh, going around a loop, and you've gone around the loop a million times. Then it makes sense that for the million and first time, for the, for the data that you would need if you were going to go around the million and first time, it makes sense for that to be loaded, up in, uh, loaded into, the, into the cache pipeline. But the million and first time, you stop, right? That because you only wanted to iterate a million times. And Everything that's been preloaded into all the caches has to, be, has to be thrown away. This cache miss will cost you of the order of between 500 and 1,000 processor instructions while, 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 while it's reloaded. And it will really, obviously, if you're only doing once, if, if that only happens once in a million iterations, it's not too bad. But if it happens a lot, you're really going to see the performance of your program damaged really badly. And so the proxy that we used to use for, the, for estimating the, the execution time of a program, we used to say, and it's kind of intuitive to think, let's see how many instructions this program is executing. Because like everyone knows that two instructions take twice as long to execute as one instruction. And so uh, 100 instructions is, and, uh, will take 100 times as long as one instruction. And that's how we used to measure it. And if, you've, and if you did any um, uh, algorithmic time complexity, you know, the big O notation, if you used that when, when you were at university, whatever, then you'll know that, that that analysis is kind of assumes, it's kind of interesting to know how many program execution steps your program's going to take. And it might be really useful if that told you how slow the program was going to be. But it turns out that now this matter of, um, of cache misses, which is only one aspect of the hardware that I'm talking about. I mean, the hardware's as complicated as that silly screensaver I showed you. But this one aspect is really critical for the performance of your program. There are many others, but this one really counts. So, uh, so the, uh, the, 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 the particular algorithm I want to show you 
that the hardware engineers use for making sure that, you, that, the, that the caches work efficiently is called stride prefetching. And the idea is that if, you've got, uh, that if your program is going through, so I should, I should uh, just to, just to uh, orient you on this diagram, the, 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 the top is a processor, below that is some, uh, the L1, some of the L1 cache lines. A unit of L1 cache is called a, a cache line. It's 64 bytes, and it gets loaded from memory in one go. And, uh, and, and evicted in one go. So we imagine that these different cache lines correspond to different places in memory, and now, we've got, and now we imagine that we've got a program which is, which is, which is regularly stepping along the memory locations. Well, the, the, the hardware will look at this and it'll figure, okay, then the next one that is going to be wanted is going to be the, is going to be, is going to be the next one along, because it's used the regularity of, of access there to preload that into, into, into level one cache. And therefore, by the time that the, uh, that the processor needs it, it's already there, close to, the, close to hand for the processor. Well, the problem, the problem with this, with object-oriented programs, and it's not only Java that suffers from this problem, but any program that, that has objects and references to objects and uses those, uses those references to traverse uh, an object graph is that what you've got, instead of some kind of regular um, a pattern of movement through, the, through memory, you've got this kind of crazy data-dependent loads. Um, imagine a linked list. Well, you just don't know where the next reference is pointing to. It's pointing to somewhere else completely in memory. And, this is a, and the result of that is that stride prefetching simply doesn't work at all for object-oriented programs. It sometimes, that's, that's putting it a bit strongly. It sometimes works if you happen to get your data, in, your objects organized into the right place. It certainly will work with primitive arrays, that's, that's for sure. And it will work with, um, uh, and sometimes garbage collection will organize your objects into a, in, into a way that will, make them, will, that will make them more regular and therefore more, therefore more useful for this. Uh, I'm not great for time, so I, won't add, so I won't add to your grief over this by telling you, by going in detail, into how this is not the only problem. The, the, there's a further problem, which is that the processor uses virtual memory, uh, uses vir use virtual addressing and not absolute addressing. There are good reasons for this, but every virtual address has to be translated into, a, into a, an absolute address in memory. And that means that there has to be a table there to do that. It's called the translation buffer, sometimes called the translation look-aside buffer. I don't know why. And that, that, has a, and that indexes virtual addresses to, to um, that indexes virtual addresses to absolute addresses. Uh, but that, that table itself has to be loaded into, has to be loaded into memory. So you might, you might, in fact, have a, have a cache miss on that. So a single data access for one of these... Um, uh, for one of these data-dependent loads might actually require two accesses from main memory. So it's like twice as bad as I was saying. It's pretty, so it's pretty dramatically bad. And this is just a problem that you're sort of always going to come across with, um, with badly organized data in, me in memory. You're always going to come across it with badly organized memory. So <clears throat> not, to, not to push that too hard, let's just see what happens when we run a, um, a, a benchmark on a, on, a, on, a, on a tiny program, which is just designed to iterate over two, two lists. And the lists I chose were a linked list, because that's like as bad as you can get, but in fact, array list, which, is, which everyone uses and thinks is way better, actually turns out, for the reasons I've been talking about, to be not that much better. An array list of objects really suffers from the same problems. And we'll compare that with a, with a, with a primitive array. You can use the, the, we can use JMH for this, because JMH can, you, can be linked to um, the Linux tools, um, in particular Perfasm. And Perfasm actually will look at the hardware counters to see how many cache misses there have been. And we see that for a linked list, we run this on a linked list, iterating over a linked list of length in 1,000, 7,000, 63,000, and 511,000, to see what the effect is going to be in terms of, in terms of the caches. We're not going to, the, the, the cache is going to be big enough to hold everything for a 1K list, and it's not going to be big enough to hold everything for a 511K list. And, and what we see is the performance 
list drops off dramatically as you go from, as you go from smaller to, to a bigger list. So it, we, we've got a factor of four uh, loss in, in, in performance. But if we look at why that is the case, well, we see that the number of clock ticks per instruction, that is the speed at which each instruction executes, is dropping in the same kind of, it's dropping in the same kind of way. And if we look at each operation on the, in Java terms, we see that, uh, that the number of cycles required for each operation also dropping in, in exactly the same way. But the number of instructions per operation is exactly the same. And as you would expect, I mean, if you, it doesn't matter really how big a, a, a link, how, how many elements there are to a linked list, the number of instructions that are required to get you from one cell to the next cell are always going to be the same, right? So why is it taking so much longer just to do a linear iteration over, over a long list rather than a short one? Well, the answer comes, if, and, and I, I actually even highlighted the, the, um, the, the number of instructions uh, to, to show you that, that in fact, it's in terms of your big O uh, analysis, your time complexity, this is exactly, the, there's, there's absolutely no difference between the, between the short list and the long list. But what is happening is, that the, is the number of cache misses is going up. The number of level one cache misses has gone up. And you think, that isn't really an awful lot, really. I mean, you know, like, so there's a cache, there's a cache miss for every... Uh, um, in, in practice, actually, there's a cache miss for every operation. And it's gone up from one to two and a half at the, um, at the, for, the, for the long list. Could that really account for such a drop in performance? Well, it could do if you remember how expensive a cache miss is. Cache miss is going to cost hundreds and hundreds of CPU cycles. And so, so get, getting that right is actually really, is re, is really important. And I can go on, but, it doesn't, but the, the, the other figures really just, just kind of back that up. We, that's, the last level, that's the last level cache. So, the, the, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, at the bottom there. And even the last level cache, the big one at the bottom, the, the L3 cache, that's starting to miss. So those are, the, those are the things that are really that are killing the performance of a linked list. If we look at a primitive array, the number of, uh, the number of cycles per uh, instruction just stays exactly the same. And the reason for that is, of course, the number of instructions per operation actually are not all that different from a linked list. I mean, it's, like, it's half as many, but it doesn't account for the fact that the, uh, the, the uh, performance along the top remains just the same. And the reason it remains just the same is the, if you look at the cache misses, you see there aren't any, or they're starting to pick up finally right at the end there. And the reason the cache, the, there aren't any cache misses is because, you, it's because linear stepping along an array one element at a time is exactly suited to stride prefetching that algorithm there so the hardware can anticipate exactly where it's coming from, where the, where the data is going to come from, and it can prefetch everything into the, into the caches. So, you know, it's possible to be wrong about things in just an incredibly large variety of ways. The first book that, uh, that, I, that was on my introduction there was a, uh, a book that I wrote with Phil Wadler, um, the, function, the famous functional programmer, about um, generics. generics and, uh, it's, it's called Generics and Collections. And we looked at the collections there. I wrote the collections half of it. And we thought these collections were really very good compared to arrays. And you, you could see what arrays were doing. This is way back. This is back in 2006 or so, I think, so, for Java 5. And we came to the conclusion that arrays were really a legacy data structure. Right? There was nothing you could do with arrays that you couldn't do better with, um, with, with collections. But Functional programmers are famous, uh, Phil is a functional programmer, and functional programmers are famous for not caring as much as they should do about performance. They care about a lot of other things. And uh, so the, le um, 13 years down the line, arrays are not yet a legacy data structure if you want your program to perform, to perform reasonably well. Of course, this is, of course, performance is only one fairly small factor in most practical programs. So most of the time you, you don't care about this stuff. But when you do care about it from, from a performance point of view, then you really need to know how it's working. And, and, and amongst, the, amongst the collections, the, the, one that, the one that really is, the, that is outstanding is linked list. I, I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of a shame, really, to, uh, to mock it, because it, like, nobody really loves it very much. Josh Bloch invented it, and this is what he tweeted about it. You've got, to, you've got to feel a bit sorry for it, right? <laughs> nobody, nobody loves it. There are, um, there are collections uh, classes that 
uh, collection frameworks for Java that try to pay attention to this. They try to reduce memory footprint. But mostly, uh, and I, the, I, have a, I have a list of them, which I, I really should put onto a, I'll put onto a slide at some point. Eclipse Collections, FastUtil, Vava, um, the Guava Trove. Um, and these, these, all of them pay more attention to memory footprint than the Java Collections uh, do. But they, all, they, as far as I know, they all suffer to a greater or lesser extent from the problem that I've been talking about of data-dependent loads. In the works for Java, uh, in, in it'll be coming in Java 15 or Java 19 or something. No, in, in some at some point, Project Valhalla is designed to produce value objects, which will be organised in memory in the same kind of way as primitive arrays as, as primitives are. And that the the idea of that is that it, they will combine the best of the object-oriented nature of collections with the uh, with the memory. A structure of, of primitives, and they'll, in other words, you'll code them like a, you'll code them like objects, but you but they'll actually behave in memory like like primitives. But that's a very ambitious project, and it's still not it's still not at uh, completion yet. Okay, so um, the conclusions with four minutes to go for this. Uh, I've done well today. So my uh, the, my conclusions for this are that we don't want to get into the situation where, as according to a famous science fiction author. Um, and we know that this is true. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And actually, if we're not careful, the way we treat what happens when we write Java, computer.java, like it is like magic. The, it's, it's so advanced, there's so much going on there that it's tempting to just say, hey, I don't understand that. You know, I'll, just, I'll just understand my program at the level of source code. But I don't think that we're doing our job properly as programmers if that's where we leave it. Because there's a whole lot of stuff that is actually really um, important in, in its implications for us to understand. And it may, actually be, it may actually be important in practice for us to understand. When something goes wrong with all of this machinery, or it doesn't work quite as well as we would like, then, it, then under, understanding, at least at some level, I mean, I'm not saying everyone should become expert hardware engineers, but I am saying you should have some understanding. You should have some understanding of what's going on. It seems to me to be part of the overall uh, the overall business of being a software engineer that you should be able to at least at least have an appreciation of how you how this program works when you when you don't just throw it over the wall and magic happens. So I'm I'm kind of hostile to the, to that idea of magic happening. Um, the tools that are available, we, we, we wrote this talk by reading documentation, by using free tools and instrumentation, and by asking experts, because the experts are always really willing to, to, to respond. There's, um, uh, on, on, this, on this last slide, there's, um, there's some references. The first one is to the, oh no, so the last one is to the code for the talk. The, uh, the, the earlier ones, there's a, there's a forum called Mechanical Sympathy, which, has, uh, which if you read it, you'll get quite a lot of uh, ideas about, uh, about how to tune, how, how to get your pro the idea of mechanical sympathy is to get your program into line with the way that the hardware is working. There's a um, JMH I've talked about. This gives you a lot of insight into how fast your programs are running. And in, and in the case that uh, I showed you here, exactly what is going on in the hardware. For that, you need the, the, HS, the HS disk. Um, um, you need the HS disk um, thing. I've forgotten what the name of it is. DLL. No, not DLL. But you know um, the binary, which allows you to decompile the, the Intel x86 machine instructions into into assembler. The one in the middle, JitWatch, is a, is a really good example of a fantastically valuable tool. It tells you what the just-in-time compiler is doing, what optimizations it's applying, when things have been compiled, when when they've when when they've been optimized, and when they've been de-optimized, which has to happen sometimes. This was written by Chris Newland, and the reason that he wrote it is just because he wanted to understand what was going on. So it was accessible enough to him to produce this really fantastic tool that any of us can now use. So, so, the, so the tools and, and the, the instrumentation and the documentation and the help are all there available to you if you want to learn more about this stuff. And I really feel, feel that should be part of, part of, part of um, uh, the, uh, the toolkit of every kind of well-grounded Java programmer. So, thank you very much for your attention.